Hello everyone, welcome to yet another edition of the Rebound series. My name is Farai Mwakutuya. Today we're talking about the mainstay sector of Zimbabwe's economy, agriculture. On a good trajectory now, on the back of a very good rainy season, projections of a bumper harvest and increases in performance and output across all major sectors and crops. Can that be sustained going forward? What do we need to do to be able to build on that foundation? That will be the focus of our discussion today. And I'll be joined, I'm joined rather, by the Executive Director of the Zimbabwe Farmers Union, Mr. Paul Zakaria. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you so much, Farai. Great. Uh, suppose, uh, let me kick off by asking you, it's uh, more than two decades now since we embarked on the land reform program. Are you happy or do you believe that farming is where it ought to be at this point in time after that period of time? Well, clearly after the land reform program, um, I would say we have progressed slowly. And the reasons are there, of course. We have um, the known things that have happened, the, res the resistance to the land reform program and also the lack of skills on the part of uh, the beneficiaries of the land reform program, uh, lack of uh, or limited access to finance. Capital mm -hmm. has been very elusive. Uh, you look at uh, the cost of money, it is really not for agriculture, and uh, also the short-term nature of the funding mm -hmm. is also not uh, what is expected of in agriculture. There is a need for your, you know, working capital requirements, the medium term and the long term requirements. So the type of money that we have had over the years after the land reform program has not been the right type of money for agriculture. Mm -hmm. So that slowed us down quite a bit. And our markets also, they didn't perform. And uh, we, you know, the whole issue about uh, farmers crying foul when mm -hmm. they have produced uh, our uh, productivity levels, they went down. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of getting the real value out of productivity, we ended up compensating our low productivity in the price. True. So you see that our producer prices are really, really quite high. Mm -hmm. So we need to fix that, uh, that equation. Let me, okay, that point you just raised is very important. I'll come to it very shortly. Uh, I want to address the, the point you've just talked about, access to finance. Um, back and forth issue of 99-year leases, are they bankable or not? Banks, we're told, are happy with them, uh, but not advancing the loans. So in your view, has that issue been handled? Has that been finally been put to bed, that issue of 99-year of leases? Well, the answer is, straight answer is no. Because if it had been put to bed, we would be seeing 99-year leases that have been used to unlock uh, credit uh, from financial institutions. So there has not been movement in that regard. Um, the 99-year lease itself, as, as one looks at it from a banking perspective, it, it is not as secure um, to attract uh, such, uh, such uh, facilities, loans and so on. So it is not a very secure document because uh, the bank would want to fall back on something if mm -hmm. one defaults. So the falling back on a 99-year lease, which to some extent does not represent real value, it is, uh, that is the bone of contention, mm -hmm. actually. So from other angles, the banking or the financial institutions may agree that the document is uh, watertight, mm -hmm. but then in practice, they look at it and they see that it has serious, serious uh, holes in it. Mm -hmm. And that is why practically they are not taking it. So they talk about it being transferable, you know, so that it becomes really bankable. Mm -hmm. So if you default, you lose your 99-year lease to the bank and it is transferred to somebody else. And that is where real value is then uh, generated. Could the authorities be trying to perhaps send a signal to the financial sector we, with the, form, with the um, 
you know, formation of the land bank that we've just seen, uh, which will address some of these concerns of the nature of finance, the tenure of finance. May that be a way to say to the financial sector, okay, we are willing as government to, 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 to take the lead and show which way we want things to go, and then, you know, therefore ba other banks will follow suit. Well, it could be one of the ways to do it. Um, every financial institution uses resources, mm -hmm. either from depositors or it's some credit line that is coming from somewhere. So it means they are holding money that will be paid back at some point. So it is critical that as they own land, there has to be this you know, measure or level of uh, uh, security around these facilities. So yes, we first, the first port of call is the viability of the enterprise. What are we financing? Mm -hmm. Are there markets for that, skills to produce, and to satisfy the demands of the market? That is a very good reason to lend money. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then there are other risks that are uh, associated with the business that we do. And those risks must be mitigated somehow. Mm -hmm. And this is where, because we do not know what these risks are and what damage they may cause, Therefore, other measures to secure the facility are then you know, put in place. So with the land bank, we do expect to see some level of innovation in there. Um, working around the 99-year leases, even the, the, the A1 permits, mm -hmm. because we know of countries where permits actually, because they are bankable, in nature mm -hmm. and the 99 year leases are bankable brazil for instance mm -hmm. and it's not even 99 year uh, lease it's a 10 year lease mm -hmm. and yet they are bankable and you know farmers can actually go to the bank and deposit their 99 year lease and on the uh, their 10 year lease and on the back of that access uh, finance mm -hmm. so we 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 expect to see some level of uh, innovation within mm -hmm. the land bank Mm -hmm. around this issue and also some level of sacrifice releasing uh, certain responsibilities to the farmers mm -hmm. so that the farmers uh, know that there are obligations here and we are not just receiving free funds we need to really be we're talking about the rebound of the economy yes. rebounding of the economy and this is exactly what it is it's business so agreements have to be uh, observed and mm -hmm. obligations must be met and this is where we are coming from and I'm sure that we are getting there uh, there is there is a level of appreciation of business principles as we speak the capitalization of the land bank um, I suppose it's uh, you know obviously seed capital now and early days but uh, you know perhaps not enough to satisfy the demand for finance that is out there we will need to do a, 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 an inventory uh, of uh, what is required in the short term, what is required in the medium term, talking about mechanization, mm -hmm. talking about you know, the implements that are required. Now with Fumvudza, uh, mechanization of uh, the Fumvudza uh, concept, mm -hmm. because you know, with your hoe and uh, annually digging and so on, the drudgery and ETC that has to be removed so that the concept is accepted and embraced. So we need to bring in mechanization in there. So you're talking of the medium term in there. And then the large, the long term, where you're really talking about infrastructure development. You know, we are, we are construction on the farm, mm -hmm. road construction on the farm, uh, irrigation uh, infrastructure, and many other things that would take maybe 10 or 15 or even 20 years to pay off. So we need to carry out that uh, inventory and see what is where and what is required in order to make uh, these, these uh, agriculture a, a worthwhile um, venture and business. And having done that, we'll then look at the capacities that we have as a country to what levels can we, are we able to capitalize uh, the land bank? Do we rely only on our own resources or we open it up and uh, receive you know, fresh capital coming into, uh, into the bank 
from outside the country. You made mention earlier of the fact that there's a need now uh, for farmers to appreciate that they're not getting freebies. I think that comes from a background where essentially they have been getting freebies continuously, whether it's a presidential input scheme, whether it's a, you know command agriculture, and perhaps the follow-up and repayments have not been as they ought to be. Uh, going forward, can should should the formation of the land bank win some of these programs or what does it mean the end of these other programs or should I, it yeah i actually like the language that i'm hearing now the, the the description of things that is coming now particularly from the ministry of uh, lands and agriculture where they are now looking at uh, all the categories of farmers instead of calling them a a1 they are now uh, smes and instead of calling them A2, they are now entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. That is, th this terminology influences certain things in terms of the behavior of people on the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we are coming from a very low base, and that low base required that government, you know, puts in uh, the, 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 the working capital that is required, even the, the inputs and so on. Because there were these limitations that I spoke about, of sanctions, the resistance to the land reform program, all the avenues to attract mm -hmm. capital dried up. And coming from that law base, we definitely needed that intervention. But that is not a, 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 a sustainable way of financing agriculture. Mm -hmm. We cannot continue doing this forever. Mm -hmm. So our farmers now need to begin to prepare themselves mentally and even physically, psychologically, that uh, they will be f taking the tab going forward. Mm -hmm. So we may get the free inputs here and there, but uh, we need to be wind off so that we run this as business where you say, these are my production costs and these are the returns from the market. The difference between the two is either a loss or a profit. In an environment that you mentioned earlier where we have artificially or perhaps not a fairly determined producer prices. How do we then move to a more market determined uh, producer price environment? Well, we have been, uh, I think uh, the stakeholders together with government, there has been a, a very clear understanding of where we are coming from, the law base that I spoke about, mm -hmm. and the need to encourage production. So if we were to go by what we see on the market where producer, uh, uh, the production costs continue to rise and the markets are not performing, particularly mm -hmm. with contract farming mm -hmm. yeah, in the private sector. Mm -hmm. You would see that the, contract, uh, the contractor doesn't want to pay that much, mm -hmm. but the contractor, when they give their inputs, they are giving their inputs at way above the cost of yeah. the market, yeah. uh, of the commercial, you know, mm -hmm. market. So that would leave the farmer, uh, you know, you know, fleeced off. Mm -hmm. So that intervention came in to maintain the the, the desire to produce mm -hmm. for the markets, and it it served, it has served its purpose, and it continues to serve its purpose. But of course, if we are to go into real business, uh, we definitely will need to. Put, kick in some price discovery mechanisms that will give us a fair value of the product. And value is not only in the price. Remember, we mentioned the issues about productivity. Instead of selling one ton per hectare of maize, if you do six tons on that same hectare, it's times the producer price, and that is where the money is. Thank you so much. We'll uh, take a short break now. We want to come back. The issue of contract farming that you've spoken about is also something we want to take a look at. We want to look at uh, climate proofing, uh, you know, agriculture as well. There's a lot of talk around that. That and a whole lot more coming your way. This is the Rebound series focusing on agriculture. Do stay tuned. Every Zimbabwean wants their country to return to its former glory and we believe that we have a role to play in doing that. So we'll be speaking to different Zimbabweans from different facets of life to share their views of what it will take to get Zimbabwe to rebound.
The Rebound series comes to you every Friday between 5 and 6 p.m. on the Heart and Soul digital platforms. Join me, Farai Mwakutuya, for those incisive discussions. Welcome back. Uh, Paul Zakaria from the Zimbabwe Farmers Union is my guest in the studio. Before we went to the break, you did make mention of contract farming, and it's something I wanted to talk about here. Certainly, we've seen this model touted as, uh, you know, having worked wonders in, in, in sectors like uh, tobacco uh, and to some extent cotton. Um, but you also then made mention of some of the issues that are in there, where inputs are priced, are priced highly. Mm. When I speak to tobacco farmers at the floor, some of the things they say is, you know, they seem to be caught in this constant debt trap where mm. they, are, they sell their tobacco, but at such a price that they remain indebted mm. to this contractor. So they perpetually, uh, you know, continue farming tobacco for 10 years, but not really seeing any gains from it. Is, is this a sustainable model? How do we fix that? Are these real concerns? Yeah, ideally we should be operating in an, in, in an environment where it's easy to make decisions. But then when you have uh, one sector of uh, the economy taking advantage of the other and there is lack of, there is no uh, accountability and there is no discipline, eh? mm -hmm. people are not ready to take any sacrifice, to make any sacrifices so that they grow the, 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 the commodity and they grow the sector and the industry. Mm -hmm. And that way, everybody wins. Uh, if we don't have that, uh, that discipline, then we end up uh, having these, uh, these issues that you are talking about. Now, contractors, the, the, the history that we have had is that um, uh, with contractors, they try by all means to make their money in the inputs they also try by all means to make their money in a lower producer price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that way they leave the farmer. It, it's only the farmer who doesn't have anywhere to push uh, those troubles. Mm -hmm. So those struggles remain with the farmer. And the farmer, at the farmer level, the farmer is not viable at all. Mm -hmm. But the two parties could actually sit down and say, how can we make a living out of this? Because without the tobacco, without the cotton, without the product, the the, even the yeah. contractor would not exist. Who should be initiating this discussion and why, is, why isn't it happening? Well, the, the, the discussions have been happening, but the powers have been really tilted, eh? this, the, tilted towards uh, the one who has the resources. Mm -hmm. So this is why perpetually we are still talking about this. But we need to have some level of uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, Agricultural Marketing Authority, mm -hmm. uh, this is its turf. Mm -hmm. They can come in and regulate because the Agricultural Marketing Authority is there to regulate the markets. So we can come up with a framework of contracting, you know, farmers. What is the role of the contractor? What is the role of the, uh, the, 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 the one who has been contracted? And then beyond that, how do we perform under a contract arrangement, both the one who has been contracted and the contractor. And we need to understand what is coming from the market in terms of inputs, what are the prices on the market, and then when then we extend those inputs to the farmer, how sh should, we, should we put in a markup, uh, what are the percentages and so on. So these things, we should have an audit trail. We should be mm -hmm. able to track and see, uh, well, this, this, uh, this is profiteering or it is not. And also, it's not just the contractor. It's also the farmer, mm -hmm. <laughs> on the other hand. We don't want to talk about it, but it's true mm -hmm. that uh, farmers then react mm -hmm. When they see that I'll be forever indebted to this contractor and um, yet I can make more money if I sell to somebody else and they begin to side market. Side market yeah. And when you side market, you're actually threatening the whole financing system. So w the house is collapsing. Mm -hmm. So the two parties need to come together. And this is where the farmer unions, agricultural marketing authority and the contractors need to sit and say we need to build a house and not to oversee the collapsing of a house. You mentioned in, in your answer the word audit, which brings me on to the next qu you know, point I want to talk about. For, for several years, we've heard of land audits, uh, assessments. I mean, again, we were also told that at one point where farms were going to be resized, downsized, perhaps people had too much land. 
has there been any movement in terms of that and you know these land orders that keep happening where are the findings and what are the recommendations and actions thereof well i would be honest with you that uh, definitely would not be my uh, my turf eh? uh -huh. um as as a farmer organization we know that uh, we still have many farmers that are still looking for 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 land mm -hmm. um, young farmers you know we there is an increasing uh, outcry there mm -hmm. of young farmers wanting to be allocated pieces of land women even mm -hmm. wanting to be uh, allocated pieces of land so our hope is that with the land audit the downsizing everything that could be happening uh, in those circles that should be we should we should see some speed and finalization to such issues understanding also clearly that land is a finite resource mm -hmm. so it's not everyone who is going to be allocated a piece of land so we need also as farmers to innovate around how we can access land and owning land may not necessarily be the answer uh, but let's talk about access uh, mm -hmm. to land unfettered access or you know access that is uh, not limited in any way uh, that is what our farmers uh, require so those processes can go on but uh, they should target uh, bringing people on the land in the form of partnerships joint ventures mm -hmm. and many other arrangements so we do expect that to happen but otherwise we are still holding a tab here mm -hmm. where many many farmers and, and, and potential farmers for that matter who have the resources uh, to produce, they are not yet on the land. The issue you mentioned of joint ventures then brings us into the, the, the next you know, sort of discussion which has been going on for several years. I've spoken to you about it several times because many people see joint ventures as a way for former white commercial farmers to get back onto the land, which some people think is a good or a bad thing, depending on where you are, where you are sitting. But going forward, what, what is the role of former commercial white farmers in agriculture in this country? Do they still have a role? Yeah, we, we, let's look at what has been done already, because I think that question has practically been addressed mm -hmm. in that uh, we already have uh, some uh, developments mm -hmm. we, that are underway where we are informed 99-year leases are actually being given to uh, former white commercial farmers mm -hmm. who express the need to go back on the land. And that is actually happening. And we also know that the land reform, the question itself has been addressed uh, in the, uh, the, the global compensation okay. agreement. And uh, the, the, those who choose not to be uh, compensated in the form of money, there is that uh, whole communique, they can actually be allocated pieces of land, and that amicably, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, that is actually happening. But we need also to, uh, to observe this as a fact. The former white commercial farmers are Zimbabweans to begin with. Mm -hmm. That is why they qualify to be given pieces of land. And secondly, the former white commercial farmers, although they may have lost land they still possess the requisite skills that can help us to develop the land itself. Beyond that, it is their networks in terms of markets, both locally and abroad, that we now need to say, look, can't we build on what you have or what you had so that we don't start from you know, zero, we are starting from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we need to work together both white and black, and we should not be seeing each other in the, in the, in the, in the sense of uh, color or in the sense of the issue itself that happened back there. We now need to be seeing this whole issue about the land as building, as constructive as is possible so that we move forward. We cannot be trapped in our history and in our past. The issues that were corrected, we now need to build on them and even strengthen the relationships between uh, the two sides, black, white, or Zimbabwean, and, uh, and, and the international community. You make mention of skills. Uh, that brings me on to Agritex, the extension services which are supposed to be providing that support, that backbone to farmers. Do you think that uh, 
uh, service is, is still up to scratch. Um, before I even go mm -hmm. to the extension, I think the current farmer that we have mm -hmm. needs to look for opportunities to improve on their skills. Mm -hmm. And this can come in the form of conferences, even going on a course somewhere, and this we need to normalize. Mm -hmm. Growing maize the way we used to grow maize 20, 30 years ago may not necessarily be the kind of thing that we need in our normal, in our current setting as, as, as we speak. Plant populations have uh, improved, the varieties have improved, mm -hmm. and uh, the soils also, they need attention and many other things. Mm -hmm. So farmers should begin now to demand services. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when we judge the extension worker on the basis of uh, uh, 1920 uh, uh, type of experience, then we, we also, the extension worker and the farmer, they are found wanting. Mm -hmm. So I would say there is need for improving skills, you know, both on the farmer side as well as on the extension worker side. There are emerging crops that we now see, particularly in the horticulture mm -hmm. uh, sector. Mm -hmm. that our extension you know, uh, workers, our extension officers, they need to upgrade their uh, skills on. Mm -hmm. Blueberries, they have just come in there. Yep. And our farmers are all talking about you know, blueberries. growing blueberries. Do we have the requisite skills in the extension? Maybe not. But we need really to, to look at how we can uh, bring that up to speed so that we are meeting the demand. Superfoods, and I, I keep here being, being exactly. spoken about. Yeah. Um, the key priorities, I mean, uh, for you, climate, I mean, obviously climate is an issue. Mm -hmm. And so if I was to ask you now going forward, how do we build on um, the, 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 the base that we have, the, the, the capacity that is there, this great, uh, you know, season that we've just had, going forward, what would you say are the key priorities to make sure that we maintain the momentum or even develop further? What has really drawn us back is the issue of climate change mm -hmm. and its effect and implications on agriculture. Uh, some of the things, yes, we spoke about access to finance and so on, but largely it was also the droughts, mm -hmm. the droughts that have been prolonged. Now, going forward, if we do not address the issue of irrigation, mm -hmm. uh, irrigation infrastructure in the smallholder sector, for our Pumvudza plots in the A1, A2, if we do not address the issue of irrigation, we will forever be you know, uh, uh, going in, in, in circles around the issues of uh, whether drought has affected us or it has not. Irrigation is definitely going to be the thing going forward. Mm -hmm. So drip kits, micro drip irrigation for smallholder farmers so that uh, they are producing even throughout the year, mm -hmm. you know. We don't have to wait for rain-fed agriculture. So drip irrigation in the A A1, drip irrigation in the A2 uh, farming se sectors. Those uh, uh, drip linings. Mm -hmm. This is what is going to help us to utilize the water bodies that we have so that we put more money in the pockets of the people Beyond that, let us also encourage value addition at the local level. Mm -hmm. I produce cotton. If I produce cotton, I should be able to separate the seed from the lint so that I put more money in my pocket and I'm able now to buy inputs, in my own irrigation equipment and many other things. So we need to mitigate at various levels. Mm -hmm. So it is very critical that we don't only wait for government to be doing things but we empower the, the producers to be able to look after themselves after uh, beyond the current help that they are getting. Indeed. Thank you so much, Amasta. Stop you there because we are out of time. We need to take a short break now. Uh, when we do come back, we'll be focusing on women. You made mention of women and uh, the demand for land there. We'll be focusing on women in farming and the issues that are affecting them as well as what needs to be done to build capacity and to see them participate even further in the sector. Stay tuned. This is the Rebound series.
Every Zimbabwean wants their country to return to its former glory and we believe that we have a role to play in doing that. So we'll be speaking to different Zimbabweans from different facets of life to share their views of what it will take to get Zimbabwe to rebound. The Rebound series comes to you every Friday between 5 and 6 p.m. on the Heart and Soul digital platforms. Join me, Farai Mwakutuya, for those incisive discussions. The Rebound series continues. Joining me in the studio now is Olga Nari. She is the chairperson of Women in Agriculture Union. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Farai. Now, let's start by looking at the representation of women in agriculture. You know, if you have any statistics or just looking at, you know, how many women we have, what are they doing? Well, if you look at our statistics right now, it shows that 70% of the labor force in agriculture, it is women. And this includes women, mainly those small scale farmers. And we also have um, large scale commercial farmers. But, well, that's a handful when it comes to women. We are still hoping that more women will venture into large-scale commercial farming. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big numbers, 70%, but, you know, clearly there are still issues. Or so we hear that there's still a long way to go. What are some of the key issues that are affecting women in agriculture? Women are affected mainly by lack of access to land. Because if you look at the 70% labor force that we are talking about, they don't own the land that they are practicing on. Mm -hmm. It is either they are renting that land, they are using a spouse's land, they are using family land, which comes with its challenges. Mm -hmm. If I may give one example, during this COVID era, we had issues whereby women were unable to move to, their, to travel to their farms because they didn't have uh, offer letters in their names. Mm -hmm. We had farmers who were using... Um, letters by their husbands and they were told you have to go back and give that letter to your husband because it is not in your name but mm -hmm. she's the one who is doing all the work on the farm mm -hmm. yeah how is how how can that be addressed women need to be given land in their names mm -hmm. women need to be allocated land when we speak of land allocation it shouldn't be about whom do you know who are you it has to be about what are you doing let it prioritize. We are not saying give us land because we are women, but we are saying give us land because we are farmers. Let it be given to farmers, mm -hmm. not to the person who is knocking the most. Because yes, we have noticed with men, they knock doors until they break. Mm -hmm. And with women, when they go to the offices and they are given a bad attitude, we have women that are saying, okay, I've been going there for 12 years. I've been going there for three years. I've gone there so many times and they give up. Men don't give up easily. We mm -hmm. also encourage women that you shouldn't give up. Mm -hmm. Knock those doors until they open. Now, interesting point you raised there. Uh, you know, we understand from government recent uh, uh, statistics that are coming through. The agriculture minister was quoted recently saying that there is a database, so a waiting list of over 200,000 people who want to access land. Now, I would assume those are people like me who don't have land but want to have land. You are saying that there are women already engaged in agriculture who may or may not be part of Are they part of that database? They are part of that database. When you speak of women that we are saying they need to be allocated land, these are people that have applied for land, people that are already practicing agriculture using the rented areas like I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So now we are saying after the land audit, how about we prioritize those that are already showing passion and working with what they already have how about we allocate them land so that they can produce even more mm -hmm. so that they increase production and they are able to plan further because when they are renting land these people are limited on how much they can do there they are limited on the structures that they can put up there because it is not their land mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Okay, very good point. The access to credit, uh, you know, the earlier segment I was speaking to uh, the ZFU director and, mm -hmm. you know, the issues of credit are a big issue across the board to all farmers. Yes. Uh, are there specific challenges or additional challenges that women face when it comes to accessing credit? Accessing credit, it also goes back again to the issue of them not having land. Because yeah. land, having the paperwork that proves that they've got land, they use that as collateral mm -hmm. when they're applying. Also, uh, if you look at the financial institutions that we have, I still have a problem with the packages that they say they offer women. Because if you look at it, it's in our terms, chimbazo. It mm -hmm. doesn't make sense for a farmer to take a loan that has got a 5% increase uh, 
5% interest uh, monthly. Well, we have got banks that are coming and saying we have tailor-made packages for farmers whereby we give you a loan. We we'll only start collecting after if it's pigs, maybe after eight months when you are slaughtering. But what people have not calculated is even if they're coming after the eight months, they are still working with a 5% interest rate. And we are saying that doesn't work. If you look uh, back, you will find that the farmers that we had before us, when they were getting those loans, sometimes it would be maybe... 2% per annum, not per month. Mm -hmm. And right now you're saying the farmer has to get that loan from a bank for six months or two years, but the interest is being calculated per month. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Chimbazo and Chimbazo in agriculture, it doesn't work. It's you not sustainable. Longer term and cheaper money. Lo exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what works. Okay. It has been proven it works. Earlier we spoke about the issue of farming as a business. Do you think mm -hmm. that uh, women see it as that. You say 70% of the workforce in agriculture are women. And so they might need to be that, you know, for lack of a better term, graduation or upscaling, upgrading from being employee to becoming mm -hmm. business owner. Yes. Um, on that one, we might have to thank COVID because uh, the pandemic, uh, it sort of woke many people up they finally realized that agriculture is not like a, a retiring package, a go-to when you're done working package. It is the deal. It is a business. People had nothing else to turn to but farming. You find we have got from backyard farmers, commercial farmers, those that had plots that they didn't know where to start from developing. They ventured into farming. They finally realized that agriculture is a business but it is still a process though which is where we usually come in as uh, a union where we are teaching women that agriculture being a business you have to take it as a business from the beginning from how you start how you handle your produce everything the whole value chain of agriculture you have to treat it as a business which is also why we are saying they have to look at from the capital injection that they start with everything there, the paperwork that is involved, you know, you need to, it begins like from the start, you need to look at it and see that it is a business and for a business to make sense, you have to have a record of it. Mm -hmm. It is a process, but we believe that yes, women are finally embracing that agriculture is a business. Most women are. You say a record of it, so record keeping, record paperwork, keeping. those simple things can make a difference when you know you're able to say I planted this much, I harvested this much, I sold for this much, when you take that to a bank. Yes, because that is what they can now use when they go to the bank. They have a record that shows how much is coming in. And by teaching them financial literacy, we are teaching women that why most uh, women businesses have been failing is she will sell chickens take the money, buy a school uniform. She will sell uh, rabbits, take the money, go buy new chicks to replace the chicks that she sold before. They are not able to understand that how much profit did you make? You need to be able to know if you made a profit or you made a loss with your chickens. Did you make a profit or a loss with your rabbits? Did you, for everything that you're doing. So you should be able to know, to trace how the money was used the rabbit uh, production money, the pig production money, the vegetables money. Not that when you sell uh, your chickens, then that's the money that you're going to say, oh, my ningi came and said, kweta mabiru. Womanya ni maria ya wakuno tenga biru. Mangwana I'm going to be asking, so how much profit did you make with those chickens? Ah, shukwane, taka zono tenga mabiru. I don't know zona zona, but ha, ndaka ita loss. Sometimes amuna kuita loss. It is how you managed your funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what do you tell a woman? I mean, uh, uh, what you just mentioned speaks to the reality of the need mm -hmm. for multi multiple income streams. You uh, know, it, it's a means to an end. to then help me uh, to upscale or to upgrade school mm -hmm. fees uh, that I'm paying. These kids do need to go to school. So, uh, in the, with the need to to have multiple income streams, but also be professional and run this as a business, how do you juggle all those balls? You have to learn that school fees and everything else has to come from the profit, not from the capital. So no matter how many 
streams of income that you want. You can do mabero, you can do your farming, you can do all those things. But sometimes the other thing you need to know is kumanyisa tsurombiri uno dzirusa dzese. So I would encourage women to focus on one thing and make it grow. Because mm -hmm. if you are known for chickens today, then you have built a database of your customers that know Kwame Chipo Kuya Kuni Ma chickens are Kanaka Shekut. Then tomorrow they come Kwame Chipo for chickens. And in my chickens, as in the matraus, Kanamurkumada, you have lost those customers already. It's much better you are known for chickens. I keep saying if you can't afford to buy the 500 that you used to do before. I would rather say downscale to even 50 so that those customers of yours, the ones that know Kwame Chipo Kune Chicken, will always find that chicken until you can upscale it again to the 500 that you used to do. Mm -hmm. Then to just diversify and say, Nagwita Mabero, Sheo Kundagano Dash Badar. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The point you raise is something that, you know, again, mm -hmm. we I think we often see here in Zimbabwe. Matarot, point you Yeguta, just go Badar. There seems to be a a trend in Zimbabwe which is ah my mushroom do I go badar? Can't butternut do I go badar? Mono wesa with us my butternut. And so we see a lot of people in poultry production, marodrana, tsuro, and things like that. The process of deciding what to do and how mm -hmm. to go about it. Again, we go back to that point of being consistent. Mm -hmm. A farmer needs to be consistent. Don't just go kwaenda mepo. If people tell you today, cabbage rugu badara shekuti, then everyone orima cabbage. You know, last year I told people that Bambaira will be selling five dollars or two dollars a bucket, and that's the situation we have now. Because mm -hmm. last year Bambaira zaiwe shoma, so everyone akaba ati kwaita shortage sweet potato, regatiri me sweet potato. Mm -hmm. And everywhere you go, even in the greenways, everywhere you see the sweet potato. And look what has happened. People are selling that sweet potato now for three dollars, two dollars a bucket. Mm -hmm. Of which some of the people that ventured into it, they went into it working with the eight dollars a bucket last year. Mm -hmm. So those that ventured into it looking at it that way, if Kanavakato Pinda Shikwereti, Achi Ema Kutarunita Mario, Muna ne los ye. And someone who did cabbage last year, Paraka Wandis. This year, Anakuri ma cabbage. And you will find you end up having a shortage of cabbage on the market. Because mm -hmm. you just assumed that Ara want this and the broth on the cabbage because it's flat the market. So, can carry it food. And we are saying, whether it's flat or a farmer be consistent. But also, we do encourage farmers that you can also have mangwe ma crops or kurima. Uchita that cabbage that you're doing. You can also do other crops that you can make money with. Mm. The challenge, I suppose, as you made earlier, is in the access to the land. Perhaps you don't have enough land. But we'll continue that discussion and a whole lot more. The Rebound series is taking a break. We'll return shortly. Every Zimbabwean wants their country to return to its former glory, and we believe that we have a role to play in doing that. So we'll be speaking to different Zimbabweans from different facets of life to share their views of what it will take to get Zimbabwe to rebound. The Rebound series comes to you every Friday between 5 and 6 p.m. on the Heart and Soul digital platforms. Join me, Farai Mwakutuya, for those incisive discussions. This is the Rebound series. My name is Farai Mwakutuya, my guest, Olga Nari. She is the chairperson of Women in Agriculture Union. Olga, before we went to the break, we were talking about uh, that trend that we see where, you know, if onions are in the market, and uh, I must say I also fell victim to this, Takaitama uh, onion, because we thought there was a gap, and then everywhere you went, because that's our this. How do we... What can be done? Is it an issue of training? Is it an issue of forecasting or planning so that we don't end up with such scenarios? And I'll give you, uh, you know, something I was told in the past where mm. uh, in the past, the former commercial white farmers, I understand, would sit and plan and have annual meetings that, okay, you are doing peas this year. Olga, you are doing peas. Mm. So no one else do peas. Uh, I'm doing butternut. You do this. And in, in that same way, they also ensure that if no one is, if not too many people are doing it, they are better pricing. So how do mm. we 
fix this so we don't run into the same problems. Uh, our difference with uh, the farmers before us is if you look, they were fewer in numbers, so it was easier for them to be coordinated. If you look at us now in a population where we are around 15 million, uh, almost everyone is doing something to do with farming. So the best way forward, it's going to take farmers, the private sector and the policy makers to all come together, have a system whereby things are notified. Now we are living in the technology era where we can utilize a lot of uh, media platforms. Let's communicate, let's be able to know exactly how much is required to be produced by the nation and in what areas is what expected. We have got agritech officers that go down to the grassroots farmers. They should be able to collect information that tells us that we have got a uh, thousand women that are in, let's say, Marsh West, and those thousand women, they are supposed to be producing this, not just me, I tell my chipo produce this, my tapua do this, my because that's what we are doing right now. We do not have uh, enough information that we can work with to know that, okay, we require. It has been done on um, maize right now. This mm -hmm. year, I've been seeing statistics that are telling us how much maize we're expecting, how much tonnages the nation requires. That kind of information, it helps. In the future, when we are going to go back again in the field next year for maize, everyone knows how much they're supposed to be producing, how much is expected, and where to take it. That's the kind of information we should have for every produce, where to take it, how much is required, and in which areas it should be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Opportunities in this, yes, Mbambayra Zaka flood, as you say, perhaps not profitable. Panawan Waka Kweta, based on that, what do they do, those that are in that predicament? In now? every crisis, there's always opportunities. And in a situation like this, we say, let's add, let's add value to our produce. There are a lot of ways one can process Mbambaira. We have got people that are doing cakes, we've got people doing flour, we've got people doing crisps. Let's venture into that. Let's process our Mbambaira. Do not go out there and say Ndinema bucket and Mbambaira at two dollars or at a dollar just to get rid of it. Let's dry our sweet potato, let's process it and be able to supply it when it's off season. Mm -hmm. That's what we encourage everyone to do. The cabbage, there is also that same opportunity. Process it. We're telling people you can do mufushkwa with cabbage, wakanaka, where you mix it with carrot, tomatoes and everything already. It looks appetizing. Mm -hmm. You can package it nicely. You can sell it locally. You can even export it. For those that have got relatives, when we talk export everyone is always thinking the bigger markets the european markets but we've got our relatives that want the vegetables from home how about we process for them and package it nicely and give them they have their own market in there their communities zimbabweans communities in there then they can sell to their friends mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah Indeed. very good point there um now whose responsibility is it to to do this training, to do this uh, statistics finding, gathering that you are talking about? Uh, is it organizations such as your own? Is it the authorities in terms of government? For years, we have our agriculture sector and other sectors have suffered because it has been blame games. But I think it's time we change the stance and all, we all take responsibility. It is the farmer's responsibility, the private sector responsibility, and the policymaker's responsibility. Like I said earlier, it's time we all come together and come up with solutions together. The Zimbabwe we are talking about is for Zimbabweans. And the politicians, the policymakers are Zimbabweans, the farmers are Zimbabweans, the private sector are Zimbabweans. So let's all come together and come up with the best solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. You mentioned earlier the point that uh, you know land often gets given to to men because they are more persistent perhaps they you know they'll get up even if they get these uh, negative responses or negative vibes uh, shouldn't you be instead of saying look we are not getting land should you be encouraging women to say keep going keep knocking on the door be persistent we are doing that we keep encouraging women that keep knocking on those doors until they open but do you know where our difference is with a uh, man? Mm -hmm. The days that it takes going to these offices, the woman has to 
cutter for the children at home. We have a lot of other responsibilities that hinder us. When he is knocking on those doors, he has left the woman at home to look after the children. Mm -hmm. So most women, that's why they end up just surrendering because they have a lot of other responsibilities on their hands for them to keep knocking, going to these offices, and they're given terrible attitudes there. Mm -hmm. So that's why they keep three quarters of the women that we have spoken to, it is what they end up telling age. I, I, I end up just surrendering and going back to my family. Because mm -hmm. every day you go in the, those offices, they keep referring you from one office to the other, or they keep shouting at you saying, hey, mother, mother, but then you find another man will be given that land a few days later. Like, but it is the same office that told me, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's the situation. Something else I'd love to find out from you, obviously you, you, you are farming yourself in terms of the actual operations itself, mm -hmm. this attitude that you've just spoken where it's a different set of rules or, for mm -hmm. men that apply. In terms of the actual, when you are on the ground, when you have employees uh, doing labor, when you have partners that you are working with, you have suppliers, you have clients you are supplying to, what is, if any, the difference in terms of how you are treated as a woman? Oh. Women are treated different. Women are not given the same respect as men. You know, um, one example is um, I had a man who had zero knowledge about farming. Mm -hmm. Then I said to him, I just want to do a test. You know what? I want you to talk to my guys. This is what I want you to say to them. I want to see how they react to you and the way they react to me. I went with him to my uh, pig project, mm -hmm. and when he spoke to the guys, you know, the moment, just because it's a hoarse voice, I guess, mm -hmm. there is respect, yes, I'm Dara, Shakati, I'm Dara, Shakati. Then you, when you come with the exact same topic, it's, I wa mother, jins wa aro mother, mi right kudze. It's the assumption that women don't know anything when it comes to farming. Mm -hmm. That's the assumption. Mm -hmm. Even if you say, okay, I have a background, I have learned this, still they'll say, but come a man, they don't even question his knowledge. They don't even question his authority. But for a woman, it's like you have to fire one guy for them all to start respecting you. If you're saying 70% of the mm. workforce in, 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 in agriculture are women, it would mean that most of the people you work with or why your employees are women, do they do this, this the same to you? Because we often hear women saying, uh, you know, the worst enemy of woman is another woman. I hate agreeing with that statement. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I hate agreeing with that statement for real. But yeah, we have those issues whereby the women are even more disrespectful than um, the men. And usually when the name calling starts, it's even more from fellow women mm -hmm. than it is from the men mm -hmm. but i guess it's something we as women we need to keep working on it how to work together and be each other's keepers mm -hmm. yeah as we head towards wrapping up I, I would love to you know i suppose again it, it's a different sort of rela reality for a woman because as you're saying if, if i'm to take farming seriously if i'm to take it as a business it may require that i uproot myself from the city and go and set up a house, whether whatever, it's makeshift or whatever, but live there and be on the ground as we start and things develop. Is that something that a woman can easily do to, to relocate, to uproot and live in what may not be the best sort of quarters or living in conditions? I believe a woman can do that much better than a man can. Mm -hmm. A woman can adjust to any environment. A woman can adapt so much better than any man can because even in the social environment yes. where you still have roles and responsibilities as a morora as a, and, and all these other things remember it takes a woman to change a house into a home mm -hmm. so yes a woman can because everything a woman touches she adds value to it mm -hmm. so if you put a woman on virgin land then i trust that land can then be productive mm -hmm. And like if she's doing it over the phone and she's got workers there, that's where you are told that you have got this, this going on on the farm. Your projects are doing very well. Then when you go, the reality is something else. So we actually encourage women that as much as we 
think city life is it for us. It is much better out there. It is quiet. It is beautiful. It is healthier. We breathe fresher air when we are out there. So it is much better you be out there on your projects than remote farming, cell phone farming. You mentioned earlier the point of finance. Uh, well, first of all, access to land, I think you said mm -hmm. is a big issue. Mm -hmm. Second, access to finance and credit. In your view, what would you say are some of the other key priorities in agriculture in general, but specifically women in agriculture? What else do you think needs to be done to make the environment more conducive? We said we are representing 70% of the labor force in agriculture. It would be perfect if that is also represented by the implements that women use in agriculture. Because if 70% are the women, then we need gender sensitive equipment in farming. Mm -hmm. That represents that we are the backbone of the sector. Mm -hmm. Yes. So access to those sort of implements? Not just access. Uh -huh. We need them tailor-made to uh -huh. suit women. Uh -huh. We don't need to be always like waiting for Baba Baba Chawiya Vachazo and the movie Rakumba in Hafiesta. Baba Baba Chawiya Vachazo. We need to have equipment that is uh, gender sensitive as mm -hmm. uh, a union. We introduced, we partnered with engineers and came up with a smaller center pivot that small scale farmers can work with. That's what we are talking about. We are saying the engineers should come on board and do machinery that is gender sensitive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting point. Uh, very lastly, uh, you know, again, you are talking about smaller center pivot, small scale. Um, I asked my earlier guests about the need, the demand for land. Mm -hmm. Would Do you support the fact that uh, some farms must be downgraded so more people have land and, and then people maximize the land, smaller land spaces? Our population is increasing. Our land is not expanding. So the best way forward is let's work with the land that we have got. How about we share it in smaller portions? Because if you look at most farmers that have got 300, 500, 1,000 hectares, they're producing maybe on 10 hectares only. Mm -hmm. So how about we cut that and divide it and give it to women? You know, uh, if you go to some countries, Indonesia, for example, mm -hmm. their biggest farmers own 1.5 hectares plus. 1.5 hectares, one and a half hectare. They say most of their farmers, it's 100 square meters. Our backyard spaces is what most of their farmers use. So if farmers are taught how to produce properly, then they can work with smaller pieces of land. How about we give people even five hectares, six hectares each, than three hectares for them to produce on 10 hectares? Indeed. Let's end the discussion there, but I want to thank you so much, Olga Nari, for coming through and sharing those insights. Very, you know, I think interesting and, uh, and important, important uh, uh, points that you raised there. Thank you for having us here. Great. Uh, that does it for this edition of the Rebound series where we've been focusing on the mainstay sector, uh, agriculture, uh, and just finding out how this uh, can be made more sustainable, more profitable, more productive. Stay tuned for more editions of this program. I'll be back again at the very same time on this very same platform to bring you the Rebound series. Bye-bye.